Okay. So first, I'd like to just introduce you to the team it took to get this work done. Well, this is a little bit loud. Can you hear me when I don't use the microphone? No. No? Okay, so I'll be using the microphone here. You can hear me well in the back? No. Is, it, no? is this better? Okay. There's a bit of echo in the front, that's why. Um, so this work was started about uh, four years ago with uh, Yang Huang um, as an assistant professor and research scientist in my group, and then followed up by Hai Chuan Li, who's probably somewhere in the rooms. Um, and uh, among the students were Yang Hili and Xinan Yang, that are now both assistant professor at the University of Chicago, and James Chen, that's now an assistant professor at Ohio State. And these are other uh, more recent contributors. Uh, Vincent uh, is also an assistant professor. And we have collaborators that are in the um, in vivo in vitro stage and in the uh, clinical trial stage, though I won't present the clinical trial data today. And there's also this uh, Cray Compeer uh, at the Institute, the Competition Institute, that we've been using about 10% of it. So the uh, key problem we're trying to address was um, I, I guess best illustrated by Barabasi a few years ago in his review in Nature Genetics, when he was speaking of uh, clinical networks where we know which disease precedes which other disease, some cause other disease, some are associated to them. We don't always necessarily know exactly which kind of edge between the diseases, but you know the tight relationships there. We know a lot of information between protein interactions or the genes and the messenger RNAs and so on and so forth. Uh, now with ENCODE, a lot of regulatory patterns as well at the molecular level. And then at the functional level with gene ontology, many of the curated networks we need, we know a bit of the information that goes from the molecule to this functional level. But what's missing is really a gap here between these, I guess, subcellular or cellular mechanisms and the disease mechanisms that are not really well understood pathology uh, so I'm a physician and um, an informatician. Pathologists are looking into static slides, uh, histology, and it's not really giving us an idea of what's going on dynamically. So the aims of our research was really to interpret at the individual level the transcriptome using mechanism features rather than gene level features for several reasons. There's an idea of uh, reduction of dimensionality, so where different genetic defect would um, would uh, have the same concurrent uh, uh, equivalent transcriptome, maybe we would have even uh, um, uh, an additional reduction of dimensionality higher than the transcriptome at the mechanism level. And we wanted also to enable cross-patient quantitative analyses, which are not currently available at the mechanism level. So we have over 12 years experience of gene expression and transcriptome analyses where we have quantitative measurements of messenger RNAs, uh, recently with RNA-seq and improvement in the accuracy of these measurements. However, what we're lacking is a quantitative measure of pathways. And um, we wanted to be able to do unsupervised clustering, oh, pardon me, um, heat maps of mechanisms, not gene level, and also correlations between survival, length of stay, tumor mass, with mechanisms at the individual level. Another group that has uh, mentioned this problem is uh, Masagi in the New England Journal of Medicine editorial in 2007. They compared 10 gene expression, expression classifiers that had been developed in nature, science, and so on and so forth for breast cancer, which didn't have much genetic overlap. The majority of these signatures consisted of a group of genes that did not overlap with another group, or barely with two or three genes, while they had 250 with other groups. And the majority of these genes classifiers were not drivers, known drivers of breast cancer. Furthermore, the interesting parts, they were all equally um, predictive in new data sets. In other words, they were different gene sets, equally predictive. And the question was, what's the mechanisms that's in common here? We've shown through protein interactions that actually these signatures are disproportionately in first uh, degree interaction with um, drivers of breast cancer and in prostate as well. But um, so at the prognostic level, they overlap a lot since they predict the same prognosis. But um, th it's a mechanistic space that needs more elaboration. And we thought, after showing that these signatures actually have a lot of relationship together, if you use the transcriptome with protein tractions, we thought, why don't we learn a signature directly from the mechanism itself? 
And um, precision therapy, which is coming fast, uh, just last week, uh, two weeks ago, um, Foundations Medicine presented 2,500 2, cases of patients, a third of which had no primary, known primary cancers. They were metastases found in patients with no known primary. It's not unusual in medicine. It happened in my practice, and the pathologist will tell you maybe it's ovarian, maybe it's, uh, it's breast cancer, but this lung metastasis is not uh, from the lung. Well, there's no clinical trials for those cancers at the NIH or the European institutes. We fund clinical trials according to the organ, the breast cancers, the lung cancers, and so on and so forth, not according to the metastasis area. Organ is the primary. So they were showing a dozen anecdotal cases in which deep sequencing of 250 drivers of any type of cancers were informing us on at least on the median four genetic modification of which at least one was actionable with a drug. And by treating thousands of patients, they found anecdotal cases of remission, end of one study. So this is coming pretty fast now, and it's the industry that's driving that. So, um, <clears throat> The conventional single mechanism of interest um, proceeds with deregulated genes. We wanted to use GO and CAG, gene set annotation as representative of mechanism, and also unbiased co-expression networks, so biomodules that are derived unbiasedly from cancers. Um, in the past, people have tried, as early as 2005, to use single sample scoring of mechanism according to these gene sets by using median or mean. However, the classifiers that are derived from these techniques were not as good as gene expression classifiers. In other words, they failed to achieve the same accuracy. That's, that's not interesting. Then uh, through principal component analysis that requires cross-sample analysis, uh, there was a proof of concept by Nevin in Nature that uh, that could be done. However, it was data set specific because it's PCA and cross -sample requi it required cross-sample, so you can't learn the mechanism for each patient. Then Eidecker has shown um, four years ago that you could learn which genes within a gene set could be most predictive for um, each gene set associated to a mechanism, and then you could create classifiers. However, their technique required learning the genes representative of the gene set associated with the mechanism in each data set. And it's not the same genes depending on the data set. So we thought that was a limitation. And we wanted to have a technique that was independent of cross-sample analyses in which you could really derive directly at a single sample the um, uh, mechanisms associated to the transcriptome. So we've published our work in 2012 in POS, computational biology. And then we followed with three other papers. Today I'll be presenting in depth the result of this one and a bit of the results of the last two. This is really the proof of concept, and this here is showing that it's perhaps scalable to RNA sequencing. We did it on gene expression here. This was done in lung cancer, uh, pardon me, in head neck cancer or oral cancers. This was done, the lung cancer, well, it, it just works there. We were showing it would work with data sets that were too small to generate gene expression level classifiers, but we would find mechanism level classifiers. There's a good reason for that. At the gene level, you have 25,000 genes. When you take keg pathways, there's 500. So smaller data sets with some less patients could be powered sufficiently to find a classifier when you have less features to select from. And that's what we've shown here in lung cancer and in, uh, in uh, well-known data sets that had been published in top journals where uh, they had failed to find classifiers and we would find one that, that would be recapitulated. And the last one here, uh, was to show that we could move out of GO and KEG pathways and find these mechanisms using co-expression networks and biomodules, and they're actually more predictive and better quality than those of GO or KEG, which brings another question. For those of you that have seen um, Trey Eidecker's presentation, they're generating ontologies dynamically right now from data set in an unbiased way. They're generating gene sets associated with biomodules except uh, some of them are completely new. So that brings another, um, another problem. So here's the design of the study. We had three data sets that were the training sets and three data sets that are validation sets that we don't touch at all. And all the validation will come from this side of the study. Uh, we didn't do a, a synthetic analysis of this, um, of, of this uh, data. We, did, uh, we went directly to clinical data set and we've shown 
uh, a number of things. We will sh I'll show you the overlap between the signatures. If you remember Masege's New England Journal problem, it was that gene expression signatures don't overlap. I'll, I'll show you that we find a, a, a large overlap of features when the classifiers are learned in different data sets. So this is an improvement over gene level ex, uh, expression classifiers. I'll then show you that we have an accuracy um, within a data set using proxy gold standards. So in this case, we'll use GSCA to discover cross-patient cross enrichment of Go and Keg terms, and we'll use also differentially expressed genes that were published by the authors, and then enrichment in, um, in Keg and Go to derive other mechanisms. So now that gives us two gold standard, and we'll compare the, our technique, which we call the functional analysis of microarray expression, or FAME, against each of the other ones using, an al alternatively, one of the traditional techniques as a gold standard. This is just showing that we can rediscover mechanism across data sets. But what these techniques, GSE or gene expression, differential expressed gene followed by a Fisher exact test like uh, an enrichment cannot do is have the mechanism predicted at each individual sample, which we will do for survival curves. So I'll show you in survival curves how we can derive classifiers and these other techniques would fail because they only discover mechanisms that are derivated across patients, not for each patient. So uh, I won't go into the detail of the mathematics here, but if first we do a rank-based technique that in which we rectify, um, so that dates back from uh, Shinan Yang did a postdoc in Germany, and one of the papers she did with her advisor over there was uh, to rectify the expression of, the saturation of gene expression and conduct the, um, conduct analyses over that technique. Unfortunately, it followed, their papers followed that of David State, so it never became very popular as a technique, but we found that uh, it would recover a signal when the probes are saturated and it would diminish the, um, the rank of the lowly expressed gene for which the relative error corresponds to an absolute error pretty big on the measurement of the expression. And it would, um, and it's pretty much this principle by which we proceed to calculate a distance between the goal term. So it's a weight from all the gene expression, so the rank modified gene expression, the sum of these for each of the gene set, and then we rectify that, we divide by those that were not, uh, the genes that were not in the gene set. So it kind of normalizes the, um, it normalizes the, uh, the mechanism um, measurement. And we, I'm, I'm just showing the results here, but the data, each sample once transformed like that doesn't require normalization across sample to do the further analyses. You really, can get a pattern that's normalized. We've compared that to gene expression. It's pretty much the same as once you do a log on it as gene expression post-normalization. That was a detail of the data sets. This is some of the results. So the first three data sets comprised uh, 44, 38, and 33 patients. In oral cancers, there's not many patients uh, that were available when we started this, this study. And it remains one of the orphan cancers. Those of you that are familiar with the NCI 60 to 60 cell lines that are profusely annotated uh, in the NIH uh, for which they've done every type of analysis you can think of. Well, there's not a single cell line of oral cancers there. And it's a cancer that's increasing because um, uh, you're, you're, those of you that have young kids are probably familiar with the fact that um, we are, it's recommended to vaccinate the boys now um, for HPV, the, um, the papilloma virus, the herpes papilloma virus, because that's also the same virus that infects the oral cavity as the one that causes the um, uterine cancer in women. So for the women, we've done that for a long time, but now it's, rec it's been recommended first in Australia a few years ago and now in the US, I don't know about Europe, but uh, half of the oral cancers are attributable to this uh, virus as well and therefore it's now recommended for the new generation to vaccinate them when between age 12 and 14. So it's a cancer that we see increasing. And this is the overlap of mechanisms that are discovered. So what we did is first discover the mechanism in each sample and do differentially expressed mechanism using rank-based statistics that were 
empirically controlled by reshuffling the phenotype associated to the patient. So in other words, if we're looking at cancer versus non-cancer tissue, you reshuffle the phenotype, whether it's cancer or non-cancer, and you recalculate your differentially expressed core, and that gives you the empirical statistic against which you get your p-value for each mechanism in each data set. And you can see we have 46% overlap between the three data sets in terms of the features that are discovered, which is pretty high, as compared to enrichment and GSEA that are more in the area of 22%. Well, this is not new. When you do cross data set analyses, the gene overlap is not big, but we knew that the, the mechanism overlap from uh, differentially expressed genes followed by enrichment or from GSEA was always bigger, and that's why many of the studies compare um, rather the mechanism than the genes themselves. Uh, this is just the first such study, but we recapitulate that over and over, a slight improvement with our technique. So we believe we may be um, facing a technique that actually could be superior to the others in discovering the mechanism. This is a bit more tricky. Enrichment, differentially expressed genes followed by enrichment, is used here as a gold standard, and here is GSCA over the same data set. And then the other technique, so in this case, if you look here, GSCA in blue, uh, outperforms in the precision recall. Precision is the positive predicting value, and recall is the sensitivity. And the precision recall, in this case here, outperform in red fame, but if you see the other ones, the red's always on the top. Here, in this case, GSE is the gold standard, and Richmond is the other technique. So f five out of six here, fame outperforms. This is three data set, A, B, and C. And here, uh, again, you can see one curve, perhaps this one here, where GSEA may be outperforming in some area here, uh, fame, but otherwise, fame is pretty good. So <clears throat> we're just claiming it's equivalent, but I think there's good rationale in, in thinking it could be equivalent. Here are independent data sets, D and E, the features that we discovered across the three data sets between cancer and non-cancer phenotype, we call them oncogenic mechanisms, simply because they're the difference between the cancer and non-cancer. And if you simply do a PAM analysis um, to split your classification, or you simply use uh, a hierarchical clustering, we've taken default parameters in D-chip here. We didn't touch it. We didn't inform on the phenotype. The phenotype is normal here and cancer here, and very easy phenotype. I'm trying to recapitulate 10 years of work into one paper using me mechanism rather than gene expression. A very easy phenotype. But we can separate cancer from non-cancer, as you can see in both cases, with very few mis mismatches. And now we're showing by um, different type of unsupervised clustering methods, again with default parameters in uh, bioconductor R, that we obtain very solid classification accuracies um, using either Go molecular functions or KEG, KEG separately. Then we pull them together, we use a PAM analysis to split, unsupervised PAM to split the, um, the group of patients of data set E and F that we've never touched into two groups, and you can see that the survival um, that these outperforms, in the, both cases we have a significant survival. Um, in, in other words, at the, at the mechanism level we have, and it's equivalent in terms of statistic at was, what was done at the gene level in the respective papers. This is showing you that we can now do the same thing we could do at the gene level for the mechanism. We can have a score for the mechanism and do a t-test or compare with non-parametric statistic and a certain measure of deviation whether no evidence of disease or recurrence of disease in cancer is associated with the phenotype. And we've taken apoptosis, which was highly correlated. Again, apoptosis came from the early studies of data set A, B, and C. We didn't touch data set E or F to discover them. You can see a very significant change in apoptosis because we, really, we can say, see if uh, uh, mechanisms up or down regulated in each uh, patient. We then conducted a study to see if that could, well, if, first of all, does mean or made an expression work in RNA-seq? Let's go back to the original study of the transcriptome, 2005, if you remember. Someone thought, let's take the simplest metric, a mean expression or a median expression for each gene set associated to a mechanism, and would that perform well as a classifier? Would it be as good as gene expression um, classifiers? And then fame as well. 
Um, and here is taking RP, RPKM, if you're familiar with the readout of RNA-seq, this is the standard readout, and you can see unsupervised clustering, D-chip, no change of parameters, that it's pretty much um, not perfect. There's a number of imperfections. We, we, this is all the mechanisms in KEG 229 that we've studied. We've not prioritized anything. And the unsupervised clustering using the mechanisms actually suggests that there's probably a better organization of the data just naturally using mechanisms rather than, than RPKM. So this is, we thought, was an interesting finding. Additionally, um, this is an independent data set in which we've taken the 53 pathways that were most correlated, that were differentially expressed between normal, again, we're taking very easy phenotype between normal and cancer patients. And you can see in this independent data set that it splits again normal patients versus cancer patients pretty well with uh, KEG. And now we're comparing a number of variation between mean and median and um, ranked um, rather than the original score. Remember, fame is a rank with the, ex with the exponential on it. So we're incrementally moving away from mean and median and going toward fame with more and more sophistication. And we can see a precision recall that is slightly better with fame than, certainly better than mean or median for recall. For precision, it's unclear um, who's really <coughs> best here. Certainly, the median is not working well. Uh, but if you look at the mean, for the recall, it didn't work well either. So mean and median, I would not recommend in, RP, in, in um, RNA-seq to derive mechanisms. It probably requires a better metric. But again, um, this was just an exercise of convenience for proceeding because really the, um, the, um, we believe a, a new metric needs to be developed for RNA-seq, and we're working on one, and we've got two papers under review uh, in which we're showing p-values with this new metric rather than just a score, and we think that's the next stage where we need to be. So the problems we're finding is really that the uh, pathway-level classifiers can be, um, well, as accurate, the, uh, pardon me, the unmet challenge was to have non-curated mechanisms as well. So we've done that in prostate. Um, so let me go rapidly here. Again, we've taken a paper here from uh, Nature Genetic 2004 in which 454 creation-free data sets were derived from about 2,000 geo-arrays of 22 tumors. They, those were the dynamic, dynamically deregulated co-expressed gene sets, anti-correlated and correlate, correlated together. So it's just if you prefer a metric by which they've uh, segmented gene expression and, and clustered gene expression patterns in bowel modules according to, um, to their dynamically deregulation in 22 tumors and about 2,000 samples of different patients. The, among these 454, they found that about half of them correlate with Go patterns from annotation from 2004. We have not. I think we may have retried to, I, but I don't remember how many now correlate with gene um, association, but definitely it found patterns that weren't there. And in the last two years, uh, many groups, including, again, Heidecker, uh, have derived gene sets annotated to biomodules through systems biologic methods and others in high throughput. Um, that are not associated necessarily with uh, created gene sets. So in this case here we had, I'm not describing all the data set in prostate, but we had three, three different data sets. We're finding the intersection and we're verifying again between cancer and normal tissue whether it's predictive of survival in a third, in a third data set. It's, it, survival, cancer versus normal is a very easy phenotype to analyze, but thereafter it really reveals something about oncogenicity of your cancers. Um, and, and there's not much training required. And since we didn't touch much the data set, it's, um, if we find a, a change in survival, we're, we're pretty confident of the results. So this is what we're having here. We have gene ontology, the cancer module, that's this, these gene sets from co-expression. Co and you can see a slight but not obvious advantage here of overlap of mechanisms, definitively less found in Wallace than gene ontology. This is using FAME in both cases, overexpression arrays. 
In this case here, you have differentially expressed genes followed by enrichment. Um, um, these are the differentially expressed genes, so there's not much overlap of genes either. And this is differentially expressed genes followed by enrichment, zero overlap, but that's not surprising uh, since there were not many signals there. Now, if we try again to use the intersection of these three that were here and here, so these are 137 goal terms and here are 14 cancer modules. And we use PAM analysis. Again, there are two ways to use PAM. We're using PAM in an unsupervised way in which we just ask for two for a split. You get survival curves that are very significant. So let me go for the future direction. Currently, we have a prospective validation in head and neck of one of our signatures in the patients. We're also using end of one, we're using the data set and uh, we're using the method in end of one studies to study before and after what's happening in single patients. And um, we're also using it to drive better biomarker discovery. If a data set was powered sufficiently, can I take one minute to wrap up? If a data set was powered sufficiently to discover or some pattern within 25,000 genes, and you touch it with 454 cancer modules or 500 CAG pathways and discover a very high correlation, let's say with prognosis or with response to therapy with a couple of mechanisms, which themselves have just a few, a few genes, maybe it could be anywhere from 15 to 300 genes. You can start looking not at single gene biomarker, which by the way have failed in the last 12 years. We haven't discovered a lot of new single gene biomarkers for prognosis or response to therapy. It's been pretty poor the, uh, in spite of all the geo data sets. But we can start looking into the interactions of two or three of them and still be powered statistically for 25,000 comparison. So if you think that the data set is sufficient for 25,000, better recognize first at the mechanism what's where you want to zoom in, and then if you have 200 genes, well, 200 genes square is only uh, 40,000 comparisons, and you're still powered sufficiently at that level, especially with in-depth RNA-seq, you get to accuracy levels that would allow to drive more complex combinations of biomarkers within a mechanism, rather than thinking uh, always to be unbiased to start with uh, genome-wide. Um, and I think uh, that, that pretty much uh, um, mentions what we, I wanted to say. We have concordance between classifiers, which was not obtainable by gene expression. We uh, may have a stepping stone to understand the systems biology of some of these systems, but we haven't solved that. Remember, in the beginning, I started with Barabasi. The gap still remains at the end at the molecular level, so there's a lot of opportunities to connect gene genetics with these phenotypes and derive even better mechanisms. So that's where we're going next. Thank you very much for your time. Hi. So uh, the question is that in the gastric cancer, we compared RPKM, median, and mean between cancer and normal tissue. And if we used normalization, well, every time we, we did the differentially expressed genes, we first normalized across data sets, if that's the question. Concerning fame, we did not normalize. I don't have the slide here, but the, um, as a supplement in the Peter West computational biology paper, we compared normalized gene expression with fame not normalized. So you just do the transform on each sample and you look at the distribution of expression of the mechanism and you observe, and we did a, a homocedasticity and normalcy test statistically, and it's comparable to normalized data across data sets. So without touching cross data set, you obtain normalized data. Remember the metric um, divides 